Good day, everyone, and welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that has been created by the Fortune Society to look at and to review issues that relates to criminal justice reform and other issues related to what impacts our communities. My name is Andre Ward, and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy, and I'm grateful that all of you have joined us today here at Both Sides of the Bars. Today, we have a really, really powerful show, as we always have great shows, um, but this show is rather significant in that today is September 15th. However, just three days ago, uh, rather two days ago, there was a historical event that happened in 1971, and that is called the Attica Rebellion. On 19, in 1971 of September 13th, there were 29 people who were incarcerated that were killed, and then there were many guards and were maybe like 10 correctional officers that had also been killed, all of whom that were killed by gun bullets um, from those who were a part of the military at that time. So today we're going to talk about that experience on September 13th, 1971, but what led up to it as it began on September 9th, 1971. And today I had two really powerful and really interesting people who have joined us to give an account of what happened on September 13th, 1971 as it relates to the Attica Rebellion and also why it started and just how it has impacted us today. So I'm joined by Tyrone Larkin, who obviously is no stranger to the work of criminal legal reform, but also is one of the harbingers of mentoring and bringing analysis around criminal justice issues and how to affect systems change. Equally as important, Tyrone is a survivor of the Attica Rebellion, and he is joined by us and we're also joined by none other than the founder of the Fortune Society. And were it not for him, this television show, Both Sides of the Bars, would not exist, David Rothenberg. Tyrone, David, thank you so much for joining us on Both Sides of the Bars. How are you each feeling today? You're welcome. Happy to be in your company. Absolutely. And so I want to get right to it. Um, and I'll start with, with you, Tyrone. You know, Tyrone, you are a survivor. Um, but also someone who has inspired, based on your survival, um, of the Attica experience. So give us, our listening audience, some historical context. What led up to September 13th and the murdering and killing of the people that were incarcerated there, the correctional officers? Talk to our audience about that. Oh, okay. Um, we're going back 49 years ago. And first of all, thank you, Andre. Um, what happened on the 9th was basically, or the day before, I should say, the 8th, uh, two guys was in the yard, horse playing, uh, basically uh, showing each other football moves because it was the start of the football season in the prison. And correction officers, lieutenant sergeant didn't like that. They thought it was a fight, which it wasn't a fight. And that happened in a, a block yard. Let me give you the uh, parameters so you can see, uh, basically imagine. Attica at that time had uh, four basic yards and it was completely segregated from each other. Uh, four blocks, four yards, four blocks. Uh, and this, the incident actually originally started in a block, a block at just before going back in from the yard, which was like, 4 30 5 o'clock at night and what happened the uh, once things were said a crowd was drawn was drawn among the uh, convicts that was in prison and, and i use the terminology convict as, as opposed to prisoners or inmates because that was the um, vernacular at the time we was convicts in 1971 in attica prison as a matter of fact, the name just changed, just was just changed, I believe, six or seven months ahead of time to a correctional facility. You could change the name of something, but the uh, ideologies always remained the same. All right. And I think that needed to be shown in there because, you know, we say one thing is one thing when actually it's still the same as is today. 
But getting back, and I needed to put that plug in here. Uh, the horse plane uh, proliferated into a, a, a minor confrontation between um, prison guards and, and men that was in the yard at the time. And nothing really came of it. Uh, Everybody uh, went to their cell halls uh, afterwards, after the yard closed, about 4.35 o'clock, proceeded to dinner. And then the next thing we knew, the two individuals who was involved um, in the incident uh, was taken to special housing block Z, which was called housing block Z, which is known as the box segregation. And I understand uh, violence was perpetrated against them while on their way to the box. Um, that information came to me uh, the next day on the 9th, uh, when the after the prison uprising actually started, and that's what actually prolifer uh, proliferated that situation was that something that happened last night that shouldn't have that or the night before that shouldn't have happened, and it happened, and. You can basically say that Attica was a powder keg at time, that time. It needed an incident for it to blow up in the manner in which it did. And that's what happened. That's what started it. Well, going from the uh, 9th to the uh, 13th, you had an organized group of people within the yard, uh, convicts who said, well, this is an opportunity to uh, air all grievances in the prison. Uh, on a very public setting. And that's what happened. That's what happened. Representatives uh, or oversight people came in, and I believe Dave Rothenberg, if I'm not mistaken, he was one that came up uh, with various uh, public officials and um, attorneys and so forth. And there was uh, the go-between in negotiations between the administration of the state of New York and... Um, the convicts that was in the yard. Uh, to say the least, that didn't work too well. Um, and on the 13th, it happened. On the 13th, uh, I woke up in the morning, sleeping in the yard. I'm sleeping on the stars for the last four nights. And I woke up to a giant helicopter not too far uh, above me that was starting shooting out a lot of gas. And, and let me tell you something, Andre, this gas was so powerful, it cleaned out my whole sinuses and I could not stand up. And the next thing I know, I heard the, uh, like a bullhorn loudspeaker, uh, lay down on the ground, put your hands on your head, you would not be harmed. Well, that wasn't working too well because bullets was flying all over. It was a turkey shoot, a genuine turkey shoot. A lot of people got, got shot, a lot of people died, a lot of people got wounded. I myself got shot three, four times, but uh, I thank God that I did survive that. And you know, we talked about the 13th of how that happened, but I look at today, the 15th uh, of 19 September, 15th, 1971, I was still in... Um, the hospital in Attica prison, uh, having my wounds being taken care of by the medical staff. Um, and that was the same day. I believe it was the very same day, uh, two days later, that the report came out from the car, uh, from the coroner that um, all the people that was killed in Attica was killed by gunshot. Everybody. See, the first lie that came out, the first lie that came out, was that all the uh, correctional uh, officials that was being held hostage in the yard were stabbed and, and killed by inmates or convicts, if you may. Uh, the coroner did his autopsies and found that every single person, every single um, employee of New York State Department of Correction that was a hostage in Annika was shot, was shot on the 13th of September, 1971. That's really interesting to note too, Tyrone. And, you know, I want to get back to you. And I know that David, you know, obviously as Tyrone has referenced, right, you 
um, had been a part of a convoy, I think, that had been involved in, in intervening to some degree. David, talk to our listening audience about some of the experiences that you have had, too, as well, please. Well, I got up there because um, the uh, obviously the inmates didn't trust negotiations with the uh, with the Department of Correction or with the state. They had been lied and deceived to. And so I got a call from Arthur Reeve, who was a state assemblyman, and he said that the inmates had put together a list of names of people in the community that they would like to come in and intervene, or at least sit in. And they it was formed as the Attic Observers Committee. My name was on the list. I eventually found out because I had been in correspondence with two of the men that became leaders at the table, uh, Roger Champin and Herbert X. Blyden. And uh, we were a small volunteer organization at the time, but it's obviously in our correspondence had established some credibility as advocates for people inside and who had been inside. And so I said I would go up, but not by myself and two guys from Fortune, but both done time, Kenny Jackson and Mel Rivers went with me. And we went into the yard on the, whatever that Friday, that was the 10th, I guess. Um, and we were an unwieldy group and didn't, it, it was clear that the, uh, the, when Tyrone said that, talked about the gas, the state was the determined, and this was a, my feeling that Nelson Rockefeller had made a determination based on his own political aspirations to be president. And this was a calculated move. They could have taken over the institution by gassing, as they did gassing the men. They didn't have to fire a single bullet. If that gas, as Tyrone described, floored him, the gas alone, they could have sent troops in with gas masks on and taken over the institution. It was a calculated, a calculated decision to go in and kill. And only in, in the last two years do I think the public can see the parallel. The, uh, when you see the look on the face of the guard that was with his knee on George Floyd, you can see the banality of evil there. Um, they were political considerations. And, and uh, as Tyrone pointed out, the uh, state sent out a, a, made a press release and the newspapers and the TV picked it up immediately that the guards' throats were slashed by inmates. That was worldwide news because Attica was worldwide news when it took off. Um, and this little coroner who lost his job because of it said, yes, no, that's true. they did not have their throats slashed. They, um, they were killed by the bullets that took in. And two of the men reportedly who died from the bullets, uh, L.D. Barkley and Sam Melville, have been, I have been told were alive when they took over and were shot and killed after they came in, that they were two targeted people because of the impression that they had made through the media during the takeover. I'll tell you one other thing. There was When the state set up an, an investigation of Attica, they picked a very conservative man who was working for Nelson Rockefeller uh, named Malcolm Bell to head a committee to do all of the studying. And he suddenly realized that they were lying, that the state was lying throughout the whole process of, of cause and effect. And he wrote a book about it, about, and suddenly he, his, his, he lost his job in the state as well because the, he told the truth. Attica is, was, was a prison riot, yes, but it, it's also historically, it's, it's about uh, political ambition. It's about the racial divide. It's about uh, the fact that there are people in high office who will do evil things to protect uh, their, whatever their aspirations are, their ambitions. And I, that's what I think, Attica, there are many ways to look at Attica. Absolutely. It was a, yeah. Absolutely. And talk, you know, following what David is saying, Tyrone, talk to our, our listening audience about like, what were some of the things that those who were incarcerated wanted at the time? You're talking about 1971, right? And, there were many, many groups that emerged during the 70s, right? You had the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, the Nation of Islam. Um, you had Weather, uh, Weatherman Underground groups. You had these different groups that were looking to challenge some of the social conditions at the time that spilled over into the prisons. And so, Tyrone, talk to our, uh, us about what were some of the things, some of the demands um, that those who were incarcerated during the uprising wanted? Okay. 
and, and, and Andre, you're correct in your analysis. You had quite a few different groups uh, within the prison setting at that at that time. You had the Nation of Islam uh, was uh, affectionately called Black Muslims. You had regular Muslims. You had Young Lords, which was represented basically Latinos or Puerto Ricans, I should say. Uh, you had Panthers, so forth, etc. But there was one significant factor. There was all convicts. That was the medium. There was all convicts that wore a gray uniform. See, back then, men confined wore gray, wore gray. And the keeper wore blue. You see the significance? Gray was the rebels, as this is the uniform of the South. And blue was the Union color. So the convicts wore gray, and the uh, prison administration wore blue. Uh, the defining moment of all the different groups that came into recognition on uh, that four days in the yard in Attica, that it was all men confined that had same, suffered some of the same problems, such as you got a roll of toilet paper, I believe, uh, once a week. And you had to use that toilet paper once a week, and you got no more. You got a bar of soap. Once a week, you use that bar of soap for the full week. You took a shower once a week. And it was projected that you were supposed to stay clean once a week. We're talking basic human needs, base things, basic things. This is what was an everyday norm in Attica prison, okay? And it's not to say that there had to be overlooked or there was, no, you can't call petty, not taking a shower, but once a week and then going back to work, a petty situation. The people take showers today in prison once a day or all day if they like and think nothing of it. People gave their lives for taking a shower. And this was a basic human need, okay? The simple fact, um, Prison rules at the time, uh, the, go the lights went out in your cell block at uh, 10 o'clock, if I remember, and the no talking bell went off at 7.30. So now here it is, you're in your cell from maybe 6 o'clock, uh, 6.30 at night until 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock the next morning, and the lights went out at, at 10 o'clock. Basic things, basic things. Okay, um, all of this was compounded to make this thing proliferate in the manner in which it did for four days. Okay, and, and you know, and, and just to add on one other point, I believe Dave, um, he touched on it, but he brushed on it to a good It should be acknowledged that people that was in control at the time, um, uh, Nelson Rockefeller was the governor. He let, let the okay happen. He was under a man of, uh, by the name of uh, the president of the country was Richard Nixon. He was being groomed. And I can show you the analogy between the, the so-called one or the guy who was really Richard Nixon and the guy we just in, in, in the White House at 1600 uh, Pennsylvania Avenue right now, um, Donald Trump. The law and order guy. Very same thing, very same attitude. And, and the state that this country is in right now in 2020 reminds me of 1971, politically and socially. And racially. And David, racially, yes. And David, what are your thoughts on that, right? Tyrone raises a really interesting point, right? There's a parallel, right, between the social conditions of before in the 70s and the social conditions now, where you see the proliferation of police abuse, you see a, a more pronounced um, expression about institutional racism. From your years of experience, David, um, and you founding the Fortune Society, talk about some of that context. Well, of course, there is a parallel, but the fact is that in prisons, never have there been cell phones to record what has taken <laughs> That That's, uh, what we what we saw with Eric Garner and Richard Floyd is has happened within the prisons, and what happens when 
when there is a, an abuse like that and there is a trial and there are trials because inmates have been murdered, what they do is they d define the victim by his convictions and the perpetrator by the church that he went to. It's racial, yes. it's classist, and it's, uh, it, it's, if the truth, the truth has to be a factor in all of this, and it isn't, sadly, in criminal justice. Listen, I went into Attica, I was, uh, I've said, I brought nothing into those, that, that my visit there during the riot. What I came away with was a realization. I was new in all of criminal justice. I had been working in the theater. I was working, Fortune was a volunteer part-time organization for three years. But that solidified me in understanding the degree that the state will go to, to protect their irrational, brutal concept of prison. And that um, I've heard men say that they would, you go to prison as punishment, not for punishment. The, the punishment is the separation of society. If we were a civilized and sane society, the prison would be giving people the opportunity when they're incarcerated to come to terms with what did they do and what were they about that led them there? How could they not fall into that? And what would be the opportunities when they come out? Instead, we have a concept that is, full, it is faulty from its very concept. People yes, go to yes. prison and are punished every day. What Tyrone was describing, and you can add food and, you know, somebody sitting at home saying, oh, well, they were quiet for a night. This isn't one night. This is night after night after night of silence, day after day after day with one toilet, you know, with insufficient toilet paper. And so people talk about solitary confinement. Oh, I like being locked in a room for a day. Try it day after day after day, year after year. And what that does to the spirit and the soul. And we on the outside pick up the failures of the prison system. It's partially why the recidivist rates traditionally been so high because people go away, drug addiction, alcoholism, abandoned or abused as children, never come to terms with that. Then they're putting in a, in a system and they have to learn how to survive in that system and never even deal with the things that got them in there. Then Absolutely. they come out and they have to learn how to adjust to society without ever having dealt with what are the factors that got them into prison. Absolutely, David. And Tyrone, I mean, obviously the Attica uprising um, took place in New York State for our listening audience. It's obviously both sides of the bar just throughout the country. And, but it happened in New York State. But I'm sure, Tyrone and David, you all can attest to that experience in happening throughout the entire country in well, 1971 in different prisons. Tyrone Andre, and David, I, know this, I know this program goes to a lot of California prisons. One of the things that Tyrone and I did not uh, talk about was that everybody inside was aware that summer of the killing of George Jackson in Solidarity. Yes in, in yes. California, and that politicized a lot of people because he was murdered in the yard, accused of having a gun in his hair. I don't know, I still haven't figured that one out, but that got a lot of people who were in prison political, politicized understanding. And there was another thing, uh, prison had changed. Uh, I could tell by the correspondence I was getting, there was a sophistication. People like Roger Champ and Herbert X. Blyden were students of political science. And also, they, they, in a place like Attica, they survived on pitting white against black. And suddenly, guys were coming in who had been in the drug subculture, white and black, and knew each other, and didn't see each other as the enemy, but as people they no. knew on the street. And that was very, that was very threatening. When Sam Melville, a political weatherman, was very threatening to the power structure in, in Attica, which relied on a, on a racist divide among the inmates. Please. And Tyrone, like your thoughts on that, but the context, right, the parallel or, or relationship between what happened to George Jackson in Soledad Prison um, and what was the consciousness that it raised even more so in Attica. Like, talk about what that was like while you were there in our last maybe three or four minutes that we had. Okay. George became a hero of the populace of prison. I, I'll just lay it like, like that. Um, before George, we could talk about his brother, Jonathan, his baby brother. We could talk about um, the people that were surrounding them. But George became literally uh, the hero. Uh, George um, 
when he was murdered, assassinated, as I should say, uh, that didn't sit too well with people. And so, David and Tyrone, we have like two minutes left or so, unfortunately. And I'd love to extend this conversation. Maybe we can have a part two um, next month for our listening audience because this conversation is so rich, right, with history and knowledge of the Attica uprising, which is really, really important for our listening audience to know. But if each of you can give me like a 30 second, um, just like thought that you'd like to share to our listening audience as we close, we really appreciate that. And we'll start with you, uh, Tyrone. You know, um, I did an excessive amount of time. I mean, truly excessive. Uh, I, I don't necessarily have to go into uh, numbers, but it was a couple of decades, more like three, uh, straight time. And one of the things I, I, I learned going into prison and being from uh, the wretched streets of New York, uh, going to jail was an occupational hazard. I make the decision inside the prison that I didn't like this particular occupation any longer. I'll close with that. Thank you so much, Tyrone and David. Yes, I would say that uh, we. one of the things I learned at Attica was that prison is a failed experiment. And maybe we should go back to the blueprint, alternatives to incarceration programs. But even when we separate people from the mainstream of society, we have to be aware for our own self-interest that they're coming back to society and that it would behoove us to have institutions that prepare people. You don't go to hospitals to get sick, you go to hospitals to get well. You should go to yes. prison to be able to come back into society and have opportunities to function and, and, and realize your potential. Absolutely. David, Tyrone, I thank you so much on behalf of the Fortune Society for joining us here today on both sides of the bars to talk about the Attica uprising that began on September 9th of September, September 9th of 1971 and ended on September 13th, 1971 in New York State prison called Attica. And I also thank you, the listening audience, for joining us today as you have joined us for both sides of the bars. On behalf of the Fortune Society, we thank you and we look forward to talking to you soon. Good day.